Luke 23, we've got a little portion of God's Word here this morning that is, quite honestly, the answer to everything. The answer to everything. I suppose there are several million religions in the world today. There were several million objections to the Bible way of salvation. There are no doubt tens or hundreds of thousands of alternatives to the gospel, but the passage we're going to read this morning is truly the answer to every one of them. Luke 23, starting at verse 39, Jesus Christ is hanging upon the cross, nails in his hands, nails in his feet, a crown of thorns beaten into his brow, his beard torn out by the roots, his back plowed with a soldier's whip, and as he hangs there upon the cross, there are two condemned criminals hanging with him, one on either side. They are called malefactors, law breakers, to such an extent that even a, a Roman government with all of its paganism and all of its uh, debauchery did not consider these men fit to live. They, weren't, they, they were so low as to be unworthy of prison. They were considered so unworthy as to be unfit for the dungeon beneath the prison. They are being put to death by capital punishment. Jesus on the middle cross, one thief on either side. The Bible says in verse 39, And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering, rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in Paradise. How about that? Let's pray together. Father, help me to be a help to these men and women that have come this way today. Would you please make your word as clear to every heart as you've made it to mine? Help us, Lord, to see your way of salvation from your words this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, some of you I've known many years. Some of you I just met this morning, some of you are here visiting, I have not even had time to shake your hand. So, I don't know your background, but I know in a crowd this size, someone here today has heard that in order to go to heaven, you must be baptized. This man was not baptized, could not be baptized, died and went to be with Jesus. Some of you heard that you must join a certain church, this church or that church or maybe the other one. But whatever church name you put in front of church, this man joined none of them, could join none of them, and went straight from the cross to paradise. Some of you have heard that good deeds are required. And if a man's good deeds outweigh his bad deeds, that the balance will tip in his favor and he'll make it to heaven. This man has done so many bad deeds that an unjust government is ridding the earth of his presence. And he will not live to do one single good deed to counter all the bad deeds. And yet in just a few moments, he will breathe his last breath and go straight into the presence of the Lord. I'm telling you, whatever religion you want to speak of this morning, it could do this man no good whatsoever. He could not fulfill the five basic principles of Mormonism. And yet in this very day, he goes to paradise. He could not sell watchtowers and help build the kingdom of Jehovah. And yet in this very hour, he goes to be with Jesus. He cannot partake of a sacrament or receive a last rite from a priest. And yet in this very hour, he is going to paradise to be with Jesus. He cannot be baptized by immersion, by pouring or by sprinkling. And yet in this hour, he is going to be with Jesus. He cannot blow up a restaurant for Muhammad. He cannot sit 
cross-legged and hum for Buddha or Confucius. There is nothing this man can do to fulfill the requirements of any religion. And yet Jesus Christ says to him conclusively, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. I say to you on the authority of the Holy Bible, I say to you on the authority of the Word of God, salvation is evidently by grace through faith. It is evidently a gift of God. It is evidently not earned by man's works. It is evidently not the product of religion. It is evidently not earned by merits or good deeds. This man has no opportunity to do any of the things that priests and rabbis and imams and ministers tell their people this morning they will have to do to get to heaven. He did none of those things. He could do none of those things. His only hope was Jesus. And come to find out that's all he needed. Come to find out Jesus was enough. Jesus without water, Jesus without beads, Jesus without sacraments, Jesus without candles, Jesus without bicycles, Jesus without watchtowers, Jesus without memberships, Jesus without lodge secret handshakes, just Jesus. What's he going to do? He's not going to give the Lord the secret sign of the 32nd degree. His hands are nailed to a cross. He's not going to shake hands with a preacher. He's not going to kneel facing east. He's not going to kneel on both knees to show he's sincere. His feet are nailed to a cross. There's nothing this man can do but put his hope in Jesus Christ. There's nothing this man can do but call on the Lord. And he did that. And it saved his soul. He did that. And he went straight to paradise. Away with all this religious tomfoolery. Away with all these smoke screens and all this deception. And all of this sleight of hand magic trick business. Jesus saves. Just Jesus, only Jesus, nothing added to Jesus, nothing taken away from Jesus. Jesus saves. In a world full of such confusion, in a world full of so many different voices, in a world of so many people trying so many different things unsuccessfully, here we have a man that could do nothing but put his faith in the Son of God. And when he did that one thing, That one thing, Jesus pronounced him the possessor of eternal life. What do you have this morning? If I ask you this morning, are you saved? Would you give me a puzzled look or would you say yes? If I ask you this morning, are you going to heaven? And you said yes, I'd say, and I said, how are you going to get there? Would you tell me something other than Jesus? I hear it a hundred times a week. Are you saved? Yeah, I guess. Well, what I mean is, if you died today, would you go to heaven or to hell? Oh, to heaven. Okay, well, how how, how are you going to get? Well, I'm a pretty good person. This guy is not a pretty good person. He's a malefactor. The evidence is in. The jury is ruled. The judge has pronounced the verdict. He's fit to die. He's not reforming. He's not being corrected. He's not improving his life. He's not turning over a new leaf. He's not starting over again. He's going to die before sunset. The only hope he's got is that man on that middle cross. The only hope he's got is if he calls on Jesus. Jesus will have mercy upon him and save his soul. And he gives it a shot. And Jesus saves him. Now let me say something this morning to those of you who have loved ones. Maybe in a nursing home today. Maybe in a hospice today. Maybe it's terminal. The doctor just said it's terminal. And you know the life they've lived. You know they're not religious. You know they're not Christian. You know they're not even decent. You know the preacher will have to lie at their funeral. Is there any hope? Is there any hope? Can they undo it? No way. Can they make it right? No way. Can they balance the scales? No way. Can they try again? No way. Is it possible in the last 
hours of life as death parks its car, takes its sickle out of the trunk, and walks up the driveway to knock on your door. Is it possible, looking out the window and seeing death about to ring the bell, is it possible to be saved? This passage says yes! Yes! It is not possible to join a church. It is not possible to get religion. It is not possible to undo or redo. But it is possible to be saved in the very last hours of one's life. Why have a nursing home service if 70 bad years have to be countered by 70 good years? But that's not the Bible. This man woke up. He woke up in a prison cell on his way to hell. He ate his last meal on his way to hell. He said his final goodbyes on his way to hell. He screamed in agony as they wrestled him to a cross. He cried in pain and torture as they nailed him to that cross and hung him up for all to see. That man is on his way to hell. And two hours later, two hours later, having only done one good thing in his entire life, they break his legs, he suffocates, and before the doctor confirms that he has no pulse, he opens his eyes in paradise with the saved, with the saved. I'm telling you, the answer to everything is a thief on the cross. The answer to every argument you get when you're witnessing is a thief on the cross. The answer to every pamphlet a religious person puts in your hand is a thief on the cross. The answer to every false sermon and false doctrine taught on radio, TV, or in a church is a thief on the cross. He did none of the things you say he had to do. He could do none of the things people say he had to do. He didn't live a good life. He wasn't a good man. He wasn't a pretty good person. Nobody would vouch for his character. But in the last hours of his life, in a desperate attempt to escape the fires of hell, he called on Jesus. And the Savior of sinners saved one more. Praise the Lord. Now let's take a closer look here. Let's take a closer look. First of all, in verse 39, we see this man is dying Without hope. He is dying without hope. The reason so few people are getting saved today is because so few people see themselves as dying without hope. I'm a pretty good person, says one man. I've never done what that person has done, says another man. I'm religious, says another man. I'm doing the best I can, says another man. Until you, I'm talking to people in this room, until you saw yourself as dying without hope, you never took an interest in finding a Savior. Until you saw yourself as dying without hope, you never took an interest in one who could forgive your sins. Shame on preachers who won't preach against sin. Shame on preachers who won't condemn iniquity. Shame on preachers who won't open the curtains and show men and women the fires of hell. Why would anybody seek a Savior if they're not dying without hope? But if you're here today and you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, I'll tell you what you knew before you knew Jesus. You knew a great, open grave was waiting for you and you had no hope on the other side. What a blessed day when the Holy Spirit of God brought that reality to your heart. What a blessed day when the Holy Spirit of God brought that conviction into your life. This convict, convicted of man, now finds himself convicted of God. I'm going to die. You know, at 20, you might not think that. Deanna told me, she said, I'm getting old too. I'm 22. That elicited no sympathy for me whatsoever. I feel the least bit sorry for her. I'm telling you, you might be 18 this morning, you might be 28, you might be 38, and all you see is open highway in front of you. All you see is 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 travel and gasoline and 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 a long way to go. I'm telling you, death 
Death has not told you when he'll visit. Death has not said... It, listen, there's not a road sign that says 48 years to death, 47 years to death, 46 years to death. Some people took an, the next exit. They didn't know that was their exit, but they took it. Some people thought they had a 500 miles to go, but, but the, the exit ramp for them was just three miles down the road. I'm telling you, every one of us is going to die. This man just, just had a realization, it's going to hit me. It's going to, not the other guy, me, me. He's hanging on a cross. I'm going to die. He knew that. And he just saw himself dying. He looked at that crowd. There's mama. She can't help. There's a guy, there's a guy I robbed the store with. He can't help. There's the soldier. He's not going to help. There's the judge. He's sure not going to help me. That guy's got nobody to help him. But as he turns and looks, there's a bloody beaten man nailed to a cross right beside him who's not whining. He's not cussing. He's not complaining. He's not begging, pleading for mercy. He's not saying he was framed. As a lamb before her shearers is dumb, that man on that middle cross opens not his mouth. He is led as a sheep to the slaughter without a bleat, without a murmur, without a gripe. He is shaking no inward fist at God. And it goes to work on the man hanging beside him. Look at verse number 40. Not only does he see he's dying without hope, verse 40 the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God? How about that? We live in a blasphemous generation. People mock God, they don't fear Him. People tell jokes about God, they don't fear Him. People thumb their nose at God, they don't fear Him. People think they can live however they want, do whatever they want to do, and, and God just let them all into heaven, they don't fear Him. I'm telling you, this man, looking death right in the eye, suddenly came to a very important realization. God is to be feared. Now, you don't have to like that. I know it's 2015. I know I'm living in the United States of America. I know we're all liberal, broad-minded, tolerant. Let's just love everybody. God is love. God's a great big kiss and a marshmallow. And God doesn't care what you do. I'm telling you, God does care what you do. He's holy. He's righteous. He's pure. He's clean. He's undefiled. Heaven is a place without sin. They don't murder in heaven. They don't rape in heaven. They don't molest in heaven. They don't kidnap in heaven. They don't lie in heaven. It's a holy place with a holy God. That thief's about to die and he, he leans across Jesus and looks over at his gambling buddy. And he leans across Jesus, looks over at his stealing buddy. He leans across Jesus, looks at the man he committed murder with. And he said, it's, don't you think it's about time we got scared of God? You here this morning, you're not saved yet? I know why you're not saved, because Joel Osteen told you not to worry about it. And Robert Shula told you not to worry about it. And Mr. Rogers told you not to worry about it. And Mommy told you not to worry about it. This Bible says worry about it. The Bible says worry about it. The wages of sin is death. That's what the Bible says. Hell fire awaits those who die without Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says about it. You're better off cutting off your hand and going to heaven. Cutting off your foot and going to heaven. Plucking out an eye and going to heaven. Than using your hands and your feet and your eyes to live in sin and then die and going to hell. That's how serious it is. So I thought hell was just the grave. What good would it do you to cut your foot off to keep it when you're still going to the grave? It's worse than a grave. It's why I think you'd just be annihilated. Jesus said, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. You're not going to be annihilated. You're not going to disappear. You're not going to vanish in the smoke. Oh no, oh no, oh no. God is to be feared. Young people today don't fear God. They, they better. They better. Old, old people today don't fear God. They better. He said, does, does not thou fear God? And then verse 40, he says, seeing thou art in the same condemnation but we, and we indeed justly for we receive the due reward of our deeds how about that now listen this is you this is me on the way to hell on the way to hell without the Holy Spirit of God convicting us 
Uh, Sir, can I tell you about Jesus? Man, can I tell you about Jesus? I don't want that. Well, you know, everybody's a sinner. Who you call me a sinner? Judge not. Doesn't the Bible say judge not? I'm just as good a person as you are. Now, here's the same you. Here's the same me. After the Holy Spirit of God says, you're dying without hope. Don't you fear God? You know, can I give you something about Jesus? You know, we've all sinned. Yeah, I know it. I tell you, if God gives me what I got coming, I'm in trouble. Listen, you know what happens? Somewhere along the way, somewhere along the road to hell, if you're going to get off the road to hell and end up in paradise, you are going to have to see that you are not only condemned, you are justly condemned. It is not, God has not only said I deserve hell, He's right about that. He's not only said I come short of His glory, He's right about that. I never push a man who argues with me when I try to witness to him. So I don't think I'm all that bad. I'm not pushing. Because if you don't think you're all that bad, you're not getting saved. You know who hits that altar Sunday morning at 5 minutes to 12? The person who's tired of making excuses and blaming other people and getting angry and saying, don't judge me. The person who knows I am condemned by God and He's right to do it. That's the person who's going to start looking for a Savior. Man, I'll tell you, the night before I got saved, I was so scared I wouldn't live to see morning. I was so afraid I was going to wake up in hell. I'd been living like that for two years. I was so wrapped up in sin for two years. I, listen, I knew, I knew if I died, I was going to hell. I just didn't want to quit sinning. I just had this, this suspicion that if I got saved, the Lord's going to kind of like want to do something with the rest of my life. And and I, and I was running from that as fast. And I can remember, and I'm not going to tell you stuff because I don't want you to think it's okay to do these things. But I can remember running in the black of night with my friends, with police sirens wailing and praying, God, don't let me die tonight. I don't want to go to hell. Now, wouldn't you think somebody like that gets saved? I mean, that night... <laughs> But I'm telling you, somewhere along the way, you are going to come to understand God is right in condemning you, or you're never going to get saved. Well, that may, that gets everything real quiet, doesn't it? Just tell me about the thief on the cross. Now I don't have to do anything. And I tell you, you know, listen. Why would Jesus die on the cross to pay for your sins if God didn't care about your sins? Why would He send His own Son to suffer in your place if what we've done didn't merit suffering? It's a big deal to God. He said, we indeed justly. For we receive the due reward of our deeds. You know what an unsaved man says? Well, I don't think I deserve to go to hell. You know what a saved man says? I ought to be in hell right now. You know what a person who doesn't know the Lord says, I think I belong in heaven. You know what a saved person says, I don't know how in the world God could ever let a person like me into heaven. You know what this man, there's a guy over there and he's cursing God and he's cursing Jesus and he's mocking the Savior and dying, condemned for stealing and murdering. He thinks he's a good guy. Isn't that amazing? You know, you know, fellas, uh, you, you need some help. I don't need any help. You blankety blank, just get out of my face. Who are you to judge me? You're being put to death for murder. And still defending yourself. This guy hanging over here, he said, you know what? I really can't complain about this. I knew stealing was against the law when I stole. I knew killing a man was against the law when I killed him. I just got caught. I got this coming. Come on, have you ever looked honestly at yourself in light of the Word of God? Have you ever just said, what, whatever the Lord did to me, it, it'd be right. Whatever I suffered, I deserve it. Nobody wants to say that, but it's a reality. That's the truth. But now watch this. Verse, verse number 
41, And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. This man hath done nothing amiss. Look, you can speculate, so can I. I don't know. There's nothing in the Bible that says he heard Jesus preach two years ago. There's nothing in the Bible that says he saw Jesus work a miracle. I've heard all these stories. Maybe he was one of the guys Jesus healed. Listen, here's all I know. At some point just before he died, this man confessed with his mouth that the person hanging next to me is without sin. The person hanging next to me is righteous. The person hanging next to me does not deserve to die. I deserve it. He doesn't. I'm bad. He's good. I'm wrong. He's right. He didn't have to know that from the time he was four. He didn't have to know it when he was 14. But sometime before he died, he had to know. That's a righteous man hanging there. He doesn't deserve to die. Maybe, maybe, maybe that man's different from me. Maybe that man's different from the guy on the other side. Maybe that man can help me. You know, when you got interested and you invited that friend to come to your house and and have a little Bible study with you, you know, when you got interested and you invited that co-worker to sit with you at lunch and show you some things? You know, when you got interested and you decided to, to venture out to risk death by going to a Bible preaching church, you know what those people are like. I've heard a lot of stuff about those people. <laughs> you know what you started to learn? I thought I was pretty good till I was next to him. I've been saying I wasn't all that bad till I was next to him. I thought I was good as the next guy until he was the next guy. Listen, listen. don't you suppose, see the guy on this cross? See the, skip Jesus. See the guy over here on this cross? Those two guys have been hanging out with guys just like themselves for decades. Of course they think they're a pretty good person. They're as good as everybody they hang out with. You know who you hang out with? People like you. So you think you're a pretty good person. Because you don't do anything worse than the people you hang out with. But all of a sudden, this guy's not in a gambling den. All of a sudden, this guy's not in a drunken brawl. All of a sudden, this guy's not in a prison yard lifting weights. He's next to Jesus. And when when he lines himself up next to Jesus... All of a sudden, he ain't no good. Compared to another malefactor, I'm okay. Compared to another thief, I'm okay. But now you just set me side by side with Jesus. And he's good and I'm not. You know what happened to you when you started looking in that Bible? I mean, mean, looking in the Bible. Interested, curious, willing. You know what you saw? (laughs) Huh. I guess I'm not all that good. I, I, I guess I got some problems, don't I? And the more you looked at Jesus in all of His holiness and all of His goodness and all of His purity and all of His righteousness, the more you realized what a malefactor you were. The more you realized what a condemned criminal you were. This man hath done nothing amiss. But we, we deserve this, he doesn't. Come on, come on, the smart man, woman, teenager, boy, girl. Have you ever seen that? Stop comparing yourself to your classmates. Stop comparing yourself to your co-workers. Stop comparing yourself to your family members. Of course you're better than that crazy family member. We've all got a crazy family member. And we say, well, I'm better than him, so I must be going to heaven. The comparison is not the guy in your block that steals everything that's not nailed down. The comparison is the man on the middle cross. He's done nothing amiss. Nothing. 
So, he's dying without hope. He's condemned. He owns that his sentence is just. He knows that his deeds are evil. He confesses the righteousness of Christ. Uh, Verse 42. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, you know there's some modern versions that don't have Lord right there? You know what the Bible says? Whosoever should call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You know what this man does? Look, he's hanging on this cross and he says, I'm condemned. I'm going to hell. I deserve it. I've got no hope. This, the, 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 what can I do? And, and instinctively, he tries to reach for his pocket so he can send an offering to the TV preacher. But he can't do it. He can't send any money to anybody. He can't write any check for anything. Come on, do you understand? You understand? There's nothing this man can do but from his heart, with his mouth, call out, Lord! 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 And the same Jesus that hears a sweet little six-year-old girl in her bedroom say, Lord, here's a murdering malefactor thief when he calls on the name of the Lord. The same Jesus that hears a little nine-year-old boy in Sunday school say, Lord, here's a death row prisoner strapped to his electric chair. When he calls on the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Look if it's not by works. If it's by grace through faith. That anybody can be saved. That thief on the cross can be forgiven of his sins. You can be forgiven of yours. If a man can go as far as that man went. Before meeting Jesus. But still meet Jesus. You can meet Jesus this morning. No matter how far you've gone down that wrong road. He called on the name of the Lord. But he believed something when he called. Lord. Remember me. When thou comest into thy kingdom. Now see, a lot of people have, have called on the Lord when their car was going off the road. A lot of people called on the Lord when they got a bad report from the doctor. When they slipped and were sliding down the ladder, or the ladder is going over backwards. Oh, Lord! <laughs> no, no, no. Here's what the Bible says, the gospel. If thou shouldst confess my, thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead... Thou shalt be saved. Or, Corinthians says it this way. The gospel we preach is that Christ died for our sins according to Scriptures, was buried, and the third day rose again according to Scriptures. Okay? Now, now watch this. this. This is incredible. This man is dying of crucifixion. And he looks over at a, not an angel floating in the air. A man whose face is torn and beaten beyond recognition. A man who has thorns driven into his brow and the blood is running down all down his face, his back, his arms. A man who has nails in his hands and nails in his feet. A man whose back is torn and, 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 and ripped apart. A man who is hanging naked on a cross, dying. So I'm pretty sure that thief believes in the death of Jesus. And he doesn't look over at Jesus and say, we're going to miss you. He doesn't look over at Jesus and say, too bad you couldn't set up the kingdom. He doesn't look over at Jesus and say, nice try. He looks over at a man who is dying like nobody's ever died and says, and when you set up that kingdom. You know what that thief believes? I don't know what's happening to him right now, but he is not staying dead. (laughs) <laughs> it doesn't look good th- this hour, but there's a different hour coming. Yeah. 
You don't ask a man to remember you when he comes into his kingdom if you think that's the end of him. That thief is hanging right there and he's, and he's, in his heart. He says, I don't know much about that man, but I know this is not the end of his story. And when he writes the last chapter of that thing, I sure hope he'll let me be part of it. <laughs> Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Repent and be baptized. For the... I'm sorry. And Jesus said unto him, Say forty Hail Marys, thirty-two fee five fo fums, and six Humpty Dumpties. No, he didn't. And Jesus said unto him, If you sell a hundred watchtowers a month... Jesus said unto him, Have you had celestial marriage sealed in the temple at Salt Lake City? Look, you understand, we could, we could do this all afternoon. There's nothing he can do. There is nothing Jesus can tell him to do that he can perform. He can't go back and apologize to anybody. He can't go back and pay anybody. He can't do a thing. Lord, remember me. When thou comest into thy kingdom, and Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. There's your answer. You got a question? That's the answer. Got an argument? That's the answer. Got an objection? That's the answer. Did a preacher tell you something? That's the answer. Did you hear in Sunday school one time, that's the answer? Did you see a guy on TV say, that's the answer? Right there, that's the answer to everything. I don't know what your question is, that's the answer. Whatever you think you've got to do, he didn't do it. Whatever, think you, whatever you think you've got to fix, he didn't fix it. Whatever you think you've got to join, he didn't join it. His only hope was that the man on the cross in the middle would forgive his sins and save his soul, and that that man would take him to paradise, and that man would give him life beyond the grave. That's the only hope he had. And that man did it. That man did it. Now, some people don't believe Jesus went to paradise that day. Some people don't believe in immediate life after death. Some people don't believe, people believe all kinds of crazy things. And you know why? Some of them is because they got the wrong Bible. Let, let, me, let, me, let me show you what, not every modern version, but a lot of them. I, I just want to show you something. You watch, you watch what a difference this makes. Verse 43. For example, the Jehovah's Witness Bible reads this way. Uh, now watch it. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee today, comma, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. Okay, now you move the comma, today, today, I, I, Jesus, tell you today, comma, someday you're going to be with me in paradise. But that's not what he said. Jesus said unto him, verily I say unto thee, comma, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Now let's just, let's, let's make it something real simple. Let's say, Let's say you're strong, rough, tough, ex-Marine, you ate supper early, went to bed early, got up late, didn't have time for breakfast, it's 11.30 and you're nigh unto starvation. And I say, today, today, I say to you, I'm going to feed you. And the day ends and there's no food and Monday goes by and there's no food and Tuesday go by and there's no food. It's like, come on, man, I'm starving. You said you're going to feed me, yeah? On Sunday, I said, Sunday, comma, I'm going to give you some food. Now, don't you think he preferred if I said, I say unto you, comma, today I'm going to give you some food. Now, do you want me to say it today or do you want to get it today? 
See the difference? Now, we're not talking about a meal. We're talking about eternal life. We're talking about going to paradise. Don't you think there's a difference between telling you today that you're going to have eternal life and you having eternal life today? See the difference? You know what I got the day, the day I called on the Lord, you know what I got? I got eternal life that day. That day I got eternal life. If you're here this morning and you're not saved, you can have eternal life today. Today. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you ever seen that you're dying without hope? You ever seen that? Have you ever seen that you're condemned? Have you ever admitted you deserve to be condemned? Have you ever seen that Jesus did not deserve the condemnation that was His? Have you ever seen that that Jesus is the only hope for a dying soul? And have you ever called upon the Lord? The Lord who died, the Lord who was buried, the Lord who rose from the dead. Have you ever called upon Him? If you ever have, that day He gave you eternal life. If you never have, this day He could give you eternal life. Now, whatever whatever your family traditions are, whatever your ancient religion might be, I'm telling you, the thief on the cross did none of the things that religion requires. All he did was all he needed to do. He put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I've done that. I'm so glad. I'm so glad I did. I'm so glad I did. If you've done that, I hope you're glad. And if you haven't done it, look, look, it's not a 10-year process. It's not a six-month study. One minute he's going to hell. A minute later he's going to paradise. Just like that. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Praise His holy name. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful today.